hopefully enjoying this afternoon. Thank you for coming to this session at three o'clock on the last day of, of the event. What an incredible event in Miami. I really enjoy the food here. I'm from New York where the food is excellent, but here they are absolutely fabulous. So thank you for coming. Today, we're gonna to talk about security and risk and continuous compliance on the cloud. But before we start doing that, if, if you can raise your hand if you're using AWS in your company or planning to use Just AWS. Wow, a lot of hands. Thank you, thank you everyone. So hopefully today the session will go a little bit deeper in how we think of compliance and risk and governance in AWS, but also for the, for, the, for the organizations that are not using AWS, we talk about some of the best practices, how governance and compliance and continuous compliance on the cloud can drive business value for our customers. I'll be uh, around after the session, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to, to, to give us some feedback. 90% of what we do at AWS is based on what we hear from customers. And I say the global financial services, which is a separate division that covers some of the largest financial institutions. Um, so I have a lot of uh, time talking to our customers globally, how they're implementing their security controls. And today we'll share some of those best practices and how AWS is doing that internally. Sure, that's the picture. All right, I'll control it. All right, so the agenda, what we're gonna talk about in the next 20, 25 minutes, we'll have some time for questions, answers, and feedback at the end. I'm gonna define what is continuous compliance for the purposes of this, this talk. What does that look on the cloud in a cloud environment? How is that different than the traditional approach? And how can we help be um, driving compliance and help you on that journey as you migrate workloads on the cloud? A lot of our customers in the beginning of that journey, for those who raise their hand, they're probably starting to move workloads on the cloud or maybe somewhere in on that journey. But as you kind of go through this presentation, you see how we can leverage a lot of the services and the best practices that we have put together to accelerate that journey and, and drive compliance in your environment. But before we go there, I just want to make a comment. In my mind, compliance is a consequence of good resiliency and security strategy. Right? We talked about this in the previous, previous session, some examples in Japan, how a culture of resilience and security and safety drives better outcomes for the business or the organizations of the business it was PowerPoint. But the point here, what we're trying to say is that having a strong security and resilient strategy uh, drives the compliance, which becomes as a kind of after fact from, from that strategy. All right, two fundamental questions. I usually have two fundamental questions when we are uh, talking about continuous compliance. The first one, is how we shift some of the security controls and compliance controls to the left and enabling organization to drive innovation. What do I mean by shifting them left? Being able to proactively drive those controls early in the cycle when you're developing applications or you're driving innovations rather than becoming after the fact, discovering that's way too late. So how do we shift that earlier to drive innovation and better business outcome? And the second, the second question is, how do we really know when something is out of compliance? Do we know it right away, or are going to wait two or three months to figure that out? Right? So those are the two fundamental questions. So let me define continuous compliance. In, our, in my mind, it's two components. The first one is precise visibility of what is going on. So now we have that visibility and the instrumentation to drive that visibility. And the second, time, the second component is near real-time automation. How do we automate some of the processes based on some of the data, the analytics from the visibility component? And that, in our mind, is what continuous compliance is all about, the drive business results, okay? All right, some of you that raised your hand earlier on probably very familiar with this shared responsibility model that AWS has for driving security and compliance on the cloud, right? So you can see two different layers, the bottom, the orange 
layer is AWS responsibility of the cloud. That means the data center security, the network security, everything kind of below the hypervisor. And everything on the top, it's customer responsibility, things like data permissions, data encryption. Right? So a lot of, a lot of uh, responsibility on the top to ensure compliance and security. And those two different layers work together in order to ensure full resiliency and security on the cloud. But this is very fundamental kind of concept of the shared responsibility. And we talk about what we do on the bottom layer to ensure compliance and resilience and security, but also how we help customers do their job on the top layer. Because we have services and partners, specifically partners such as Metricstream, that help customers do easier the job on the top side of this shared model. Okay, so let's start what AWS is doing, right? the security of the cloud. And we're under audit every day, 365 days of the year. There's a lot of meetings, a lot of evidence collection, a lot of instrumentation that audits the infrastructure that our customers are running their workloads. So we, we're under kind of review all the time internally and externally. So that's kind of part of our job to ensure that the underlying layer is absolutely secure and very resilient. Now, this is a list. I think we have about 60 security certifications and attestations, different frameworks, laws and regulations. Um, there's probably over 90 that, that we comply to and, and we're using as part of our architecture. I'm just going to fit all of them on one slide. So there's about 60 of those are listed there. And they're using the various, various kind of aspects of our infrastructure, starting from some of how our services are architected and infrastructure is architected, some of the regulation certifications that we receive. And secondly, part of our organization and, and features of the products and the services, they're including some of the frameworks and alignments to those security controls. So we kind of take that very seriously. And some of those, some of those regulations, compliance standards are global. Some of them are industry specific, for example, financial services industry. And um, some, some of them are very regional for a specific country or a region or even a state uh, in, within the United States. So it's kind of a very comprehensive list of frameworks and standards that we follow to ensure the resilience and security of the cloud. Now, let's talk a little bit how we support customers that are running their security and resiliency on the cloud, right? So some of the workloads. This is a, a list of some of the AWS services that are available to our customers. It's obviously a lot more than that. This over 22 services in security and compliance. I've listed some of the key ones. And the way I think of some of the AWS services that help customers drive security and compliance are in three different buckets. The first one, or line of defense, is helping teams that manage risk, line of business owners that define security controls and, and, and then manage their workloads. The second one is the teams that oversee risk. So those could be the security compliance uh, teams or uh, different uh, kind of security engineers that oversee the risk. And the third one to the right is the assurance of, uh, of, of the controls that are in place. And that is usually internal audit. And all of those services sometimes can be shared. They're not kind of strictly aligned to each one of the line of defense. They kind of grouped into those, those categories. To the left, starting from the left, managing risk. A lot of our customers are using AWS config in order to monitor the configuration of their services. More importantly, any changes to those configuration, or those configuration drift. Those use system manager, AWS system manager, to automate some of the processes of making changes, doing um, downtime, or uh, upgrades and so forth. So kind of automation is part of this. In the middle, we have control power that automates a lot of the security controls to move to user environment, very powerful. We'll talk a little bit some examples of that in the next slide. 
And we have Security Hub in AWS Backup that in many cases can be leveraged by the security and compliance uh, teams to, to implement some of the policies and to the right cloud trail that provides instrumentation for logging and aggregation of those logs and have uh, a trail of what has happened. Audit manager to kind of define policies. And then we have AWS Artifact that is a storage of various document compliance and security documents that can be shared and certification that can be shared. And all this is underlined by our AWS well architected uh, architecture framework. So this is kind of the, the framework that we use as best practices and we help customers to combine those components and build their applications. We, we at AWS are builders by nature. So we like building stuff. That's, that's how AWS was formed. And we provide those building blocks for our customers in order to put them together and have a well-designed architecture. All right. So let's talk a little bit more granular about how some of those services can implement preventative controls, also detective controls and proactive controls. We kind of recently we added the proactive controls of granular policies that can be uh, defined, and that kind of helps shift that security controls frameworks to the left when we're building applications rather than reacting when something bad happens. Um, starting from the top, preventative controls that are implemented by this service control policies. Then we have detective controls that are usually part of the AWS config. So any configuration changes can be detected. And then finally, proactive controls that are implemented as hooks to AWS cloud formation that can enable developers when they publish an application to prevent certain bad things from happening. So it's gonna have that as part of shifting left to the development process and the, uh, and the implementation process, implementing those controls. Let's give you a quick example. I'm kind of running here on time, so this is all good. Example, very simplified example with S3, our storage service. So one of the very typical control objective is to establish logging and monitoring for any data that is stored on the storage S3. Right? It's very simple control, but you should have logging and monitoring what's going on. <laughs> Starting from the bottom, detective control is an example powered by Security Hub, is access logging should be enabled. So they can look at the configuration setting, and if it's not enabled, raise an alert and tell you, you don't have that enabled, it's an issue. You should do that, right? So it's detection. Of, of what could be uh, kind of misconfigured or not configured properly. An example of proactive control that is uh, set up by CloudFormation will require any new bucket that is created in the S3 to have access logging configured. So you cannot create a new bucket without ensuring that feature is turned on. And that's a policy, so we'll proactively ensure that that is in place. And finally, preventative control. If you go and you change that setting, I will flag that as change in the setting, so I just disable it and that's a bad thing. And then I can you know, force that through um, service control policy not be able to change that setting, right? So now you can see how we can kind of combine all those controls that establish that control objective. And we do detective, proactive, and preventative controls. And some of those can be changed or have dependency. So sometimes it gets a little more complicated. We have all the instrumentation to make sure that it can all link together. Okay. Not sure, I would not see it here, but uh, I'm gonna talk about some of, the, some of the services that can help automate the risk. And there's a there's, there's couple of services that help with the automation, um, AWS config, and. Um, AWS Configuration Manager, and that can help with, with automation of workflows and approvals of any type of changes that are required in the environment. So, for example, deploying an application or doing upgrades, patches, <laughs> that can help drive the approval workflow and automation. And that's part of the automation uh, story that not only you have to 
detect what's going on, but automate processes such as upgrades and, and make sure this is all happening. Oh, the, the lights, the fire, the issues, hopefully we're okay. What, what type of control is that? <laughs> that's, that's a proactive uh, control, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and finally, we have cloud trail um, and an and artifact for independent assurance that usually supports the audit teams, internal audit team, and that gives the ability to look at historical access control block data and analyze and see it for investigation, a forensic investigation, what has happened, some of the dependencies. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the business partners. We have hundreds of ISVs in security and compliance, over 100,000 business partners overall. So in many cases, especially the customers I talk to, they rely on business partners that integrate those services to provide additional value add reports, workflow, and value. Metrics Jim is a great example of that, right? This integration between all those services and other solutions that are specialized to drive security and, and, and compliance. Um, I talk to a lot of customers in financial services. On average, uh, in a large financial services institution will have 45 to 90 different security partner solutions that integrate with our AWS services. They provide the foundational instrumentation, the automation, but then there's a lot of partner value add that uh, is usually uh, leveraged uh, by, by, our, by our customers. So we're very partner focused, work very closely with partners, and I specialize in security governance and compliance for financial services. Integration, absolutely critical, absolutely key part of our uh, strategy. All right, so I think this is uh, the last slide or one more from there. So how do we kind of summarize our strategy for how we implement security controls? Starting from the bottom up, AWS config records any type of changes in configuration and security uh, policies, resource changes, both AWS and third party, so we can have uh, a trail of what has changed. So obviously that's the visibility component of it. Then the next step is that feeds the config rules. So we have specific policies and rules. What should be happening, should not be happening, that can be enforced to evaluate the compliance of resources. And all of that is leveraged by other services such as Security Hub, Backup Policies, Control Tower, and creates an ecosystem of automation and visibility that customers build together their applications. And on top of that, a lot of business partners that they got to the next level. So they can actually leverage a lot of this data to provide additional insights and additional views that are specialized for the various uh, stakeholders within, within the enterprise. So finalize the final slide. We open it for some questions. What continuous compliance in our mind is, is precise visibility that helps you instrument what's going on near real time and near real time automation. So you don't rely on manual processes and spreadsheets or emails, but automates any events, changes, approvals to speed up and drive innovation. So our customers can build their applications and service their customers uh, better and and and. and so with that, I'm just gonna open it for any questions. I think we have five minutes left. Mm -hmm. So I promise you know, some feedback as well. So not just questions, but any feedback from the audience. So on the uh, proactive controls that you brought us on the workflow slides, yeah. um, do you all provide any policies, like startups get for specific policies on existing services? Can you throw some light on what that is? So there's a, a lot of proactive controls that, you know, policies are centralized. The question is how you implement them. <coughs> and the implementation of the proactive controls are important because they are hooked into the deployment mechanism of services such as cloud formation. So that's, that's how you implement them by connecting to the other processes that are automated. Could you further define near real time? 
processing? Is it trigger? Yeah. Is it? Well, when we talk real time, we're talking about milliseconds response time. You know, real time is maybe a few seconds to a few minutes, but it's not three months later. For near real time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's not real time in, in terms of milliseconds, yeah. but it could be close to the event. It could be a couple of minutes, a okay. couple yeah. of seconds, but not three months later. Because what I have seen, that's in real time. <laughs> a lot of our customers in the past, if they don't have near real time strategies, they look at log files and then find events that happened weeks or months earlier because they analyze the past versus looking what's happening right now. Let's say configuration change versus an audit at the end of the month when the auditor says, show me all the change of your user identities that have happened over the last month. They go and run a report in something like the log aggregation or warehouse tool, and then they find those issues. But that's after the fact, not near real time, versus automation that triggers an event, shows a notification, somebody is notified, or an action is taken, or immediately the preventative control blocks the deployment. Like I say, no, you cannot do that. Stop. Right. Other questions, comments? One, one question. Sure. Um, which group or organization <laughs> are the most consuming this service uh, on your customer side? So it's an interesting question. So what I've seen, it kind of has an evolution of adoption. First, we start with the line of business because they're the one they're building the application and they want to quickly deploy and get all the checks from security and compliance and audit, right? So we see the adoption from the left to the right, starting with the line of business and the owners of the applications. It's obviously they're interested in, in speed. The whole value of the cloud is agility and speed. Call savings as well, but that's secondary benefit. How quickly can I deploy um, and, and move and service my customers? Number one objective for our customers that deploy on the cloud. And being able to automate, have the proper security controls to do this quickly rather than manually is number one priority. So we see adoption of line of business of controls, then obviously security department secondary. Now they come in, they have to approve that the controls are implemented the same way they do this previously. And finally, the audit at the end has to automate some of the audit procedures. So that, that will be kind of the third step. But a lot of them happens almost simultaneously. And it's an ecosystem, a lot of not just services, but partner solutions, not just one, but multiple partner solutions. So is your FedRAM also part of it? FedRAM? Yeah, so FedRAM is a framework, is, is a certification, one of the many certifications that is quite advanced and it's based on a lot of security control such as, such as NIST. Um, um, that's in the federal space obviously, but we're taking some of those and also applying it to financial services. It's not FedRAM, but it's FedRAM-like type of attestation and, and we have some very interesting programs. Uh, one is the audit ready program that we are putting together for, uh, for financial services. Right? So that's part of the overall frameworks the same way the well architected framework and grant certification uh, and we have a number of those that, that we align to. So if you run any application on AWS, that will be automatically fed them? No, no, it's not, right? So it's not automatically, right? So there's attestation for FedRAM that uh, has to go for a number of security controls and some of that obviously the infrastructure is but having the shared responsibility model there's a lot of security controls on the, on the application side that have to be in place, right? So the infrastructure, yes, but the combined application with the infrastructure has to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you very much for your questions and comments.